Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramph. I have a little bit of a nice little tropical uh, ocean sunset for you guys to kind of uh, remind you of the simpler times when things were a lot warmer outside as we were dipping into some really cold temperatures this week with Tuesday seeing temperatures as low as like 20 degrees with a wind chill upwards of a negative uh, 10 degrees. So it was pretty cold, especially. I was only outside for a couple minutes, but whew, those effects hit hard for sure and you know it was cold on missoula on wednesday uh um you know capex reported that morning that montana department of transportation will engage in road as affected by snow the montana department of transportation advises that people should plan ahead for the longer trip times over the weekend even though this weekend we're going to start seeing some sunshines higher temperatures and by the time uh, halloween rolls around next tuesday we'll see uh, temperatures uh, into the uh, mid 50s. So this cold snap will hopefully end in time for your kids to do some Halloween. Otherwise, they'd have to wear quite the amount of layers for their Halloween costumes. Um, what else is going on? I also should mention that um, you know, this this is essentially a week before last year's November snow that dropped and kind of stayed for the rest of the season. Um, and Montana suggests that you look into 511mt.net for road reports and conditions on your travel. As the winter comes a little bit earlier, if only for a bit of time, homelessness is on the back of many uh, officials and the Pavarello Center runs and operates their main location off of Broadway. While the Johnson Street Shelter was reopened to combat, par uh, combat the park, uh, city park camping recent numbers of the johnson suggest that there are still people on the street the johnson street shelter shelter can host upwards of 165 people uh, to their base location which serves 135 individu individuals off their uh, broadway Pavarella center however recent reports folks out in the city and the pov stated about 80 people were using the johnson street shelter over the last couple weeks and so the, there's still plenty of beds available for folks looking to get in that as well but just because uh i'm telling you right now doesn't mean a lot of the people who are homeless know these kind of things they don't have the resources to get access and especially watch this morning show so um, if you are interested in helping any of these people who are on the streets um, Either you talk to them directly, or you can talk to the hot teams, which is a team of people that work for the Pavarella Center that go out to help these people and interact with these people and try to get them to uh, comply with a lot of uh, um, ordinances and all sorts of different things. And uh, you know, if you're interested, um, and if you're worried about some homeless people who are out on the street, you can call the hot teams at 406 493 7955. Again, that number is 406 493 7955 they'll go out and help as best as they can and offer shelter and blankets to those stuck in this uh, freak free storm um, just to hopefully be able to do that but let, let's jump right into some of the top stories that are happening this week as well looks like uh, the united auto workers uh, up in detroit had a tentative deal with ford with a lot of their uh, demands uh, seeing uh, the fruits of the labor go into place sean fain uaw president spoke in this uh, in his regular Facebook Live for his union to announce the deal with Ford continued efforts against GM and Stellantis groups as they their positions begin to look weaker as a result. The proposed, uh, according to which the UAW's leadership must still approve, provides a 25% wage uh, hike over the next four and a half years. Uh, starting with an increase of 11%. Fain also said the lowest paid a temporary worker would see a raise of more than 150% over the contract term. Employees would reach a top pay after three years. This would go on to retaining and replacing workers retiring. Uh, production of Ford Super Duty trucks, um, Ford Broncos, Explorer SUVs, and Ranger trucks could restart this week. So also EV, worker, EV workers were eventually uh, would eventually be able to uh, make comparable wages in the changing times as they move towards electrical, according to Detroit automakers, which slow the inclusion of EV batteries and could set them back from competitors. However, this deal would reflect the EV manufacturer workers as they would be able to unionize this new type of job as it correlates with the American auto workers. Um, also, big news also happened this week as well, of course, you know, the Israel-Hamas war as tensions increased with the bombing of Gaza with more than more reports of civilian casualties happens. And so far, uh, the, they were able to get the toll in terms of the Israeli attack. Um, more than 1,400 people were slain in Israel during the Hamas attack, according to Israeli government. At least 229 hostages were taken to Gaza. Palestine mil uh, militants have fired thousands of rockets into Israel, including one that hit a residential building in Tel Aviv on Friday, wounding four people. Um, 
In a big move, uh, two Israel hostages, mother and daughter, were released over the weekend in a move by Hamas to get talks going between Israel and Hamas. However, bombing continued in various places across Hamas regions. Um, all, one of the things uh, coming out of Israel government not uh, providing aid to some of the victims of the attack, and many have been grassroots and private citizens and nonprofit organizations coming. Um, um, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that a lot of uh, uh, humanitarian aid is being asked from outside sources, and so there's not much talk in terms of internal sources with that. So Wednesday saw the U.S. and Israel uh, officials reject a ceasefire requested by the U.N., and the U.N. also had come under fire recently with the Chief Secretary Antonio Gutierrez, who claims that the Hamas attack was not an isolated incident and did not, did not happen in a vacuum, and he had to walk back a lot of those claims as he came under scrutiny and canceled meetings with Israeli officials and a request to resign his position and he was quoted in saying on the incident quote I spoke with grievances of the Palestinian people but I also stated that I cannot justify the appalling attacks by Hamas he stressed adding quote I believe it's necessary to the record to set the record straight especially out of respect for the victims and their families end quote this uh, this you know the strong always blame the weak when this and when the stronger and the trouble the weak are easy scapegoats and in times of struggle and uh, great and um, in times of great wealth and growth uh, the weak are often left out of some of the uh, good times. So, you know, speaking of sides, you know, a lot of things and uh, high levels of uh, anti-Jewish sentiments have been coming across the United States. Even here in the city of Missoula, uh, last weekend, uh, pictures of people wearing black uh, sweaters with swastikas carrying signs on Missoula's only synagogue with signs saying diversity equals white genocide and refugees not welcome quote uh, they also stated that uh, there and they moved downtown and began to harass other protests uh, testing their freedom of speech that the police deemed a concerning escalation of in their in the behavior a 46 year old mayor was arrested and he was told that his speech was borderline disorderly conduct he was later released on that same day so this was a part of the uptick in hate crimes between both muslim and jewish communities which according to npr saw a 388 percent increase in hate crimes related to vandalism assaults and racial slurs the 300 plus incidents of hate crimes included the chicago incident that saw a six-year-old palestinian kid get stabbed to death that story was wild with the mom and kid being attacked by their 70-year-old landlord a week after the October 7th attack from Hamas. And just so you know, this uh, landlord has basically had them under his roof for the last two years. Uh, they rented from the old guy for two years prior. Joseph M. Uh, Kub Zuba uh, will have his hearing in court on October 30th. He is 71 years old. Another big, hap big thing happening in Missoula was uh, not so intense, but it was a little bit uh, more about our tax season coming into fruition. Uh, the Missoula Current article by Martin Kidson talks about the state delaying the tax bill until the end after the election. Usually we get it sometime um, late October, early November for the county property taxes. Missoula County uh, Treasurer uh, Tyler Gurnett uh, described the state's delay as unusual. Uh, quote, he was saying they're generally pretty on the ball about getting it to us. He told Missoula Current, it's unclear to me why it's so far delayed. There seems to be some indications because of reducing the mills from 95 to 77, but certainly they knew about that a long time ago, end quote. Essentially, um, I, I get my letter from Tyler uh, by, like I said, early November, and this statement is expected to be December 8th when you get your tax information on this uh, as well. Some blame the mills uh, for schools, while this article suggests it's on the state to blame for these delays. And also, it's been a long time since uh, Missoula's grandstands at the fairgrounds were replaced or updated, and now they are uh, on the docket for being torn down and replaced with something newer in time for the Western Montana State Fair next year. Commissioners on Thursday approved two contracts related to the project, including a 246000 deal with Jackson Co Contractor Group to deconstruct the grandstands and a separate 267,000 contract with A&E Architects to design the new facility. This is gonna be a $3 million facility and a lot of the money is being through uh, different organizations, including Stockman Bank, and it'll be told a uh, private donation totaling up upwards of $3 million in construction dollars and will not affect your tax bill. And as a result, the new facility will be named the uh, Clouds Bearer Arena for the construction company, stock, uh, from the construction company and Stockman Banker. But even with their support, the project faces a fundraising gap of around $400,000 and are still looking for donations. So those are the things that are kind of happening in and around the city of Missoula. We also have some other things happening this weekend in, at the 
Missoula Public Library. Of course, I'll talk about this a little bit more during the events, but the library will be hosting a uh, Halloween celebration for the family from 12 to 4 p.m. on Sunday here at the Public Library. And uh, we'll also do a bunch of other things this weekend with MCAT with our Saturday drop-ins and our Saturday dance party. Um, here is a promo of all the things happening in and around the city of Missoula and some stop animation videos uh, made by the kids last Saturday. Don't cats like mice? I totally didn't do it. Winter Blues got you down. MCAT is back once again with Winter Days. Stop motion, movie making, and more with a seasonal camp. Winter Days is three days of fun from December 27th to the 29th, starting at 10 a.m. Stay cool, Missoula. Ah, uh, yes. We got our Winter Days camp. I always forget, I, I forgot to mention that. We're going to be uh, start advertising for Winter Days. You're going to be start seeing that last ad quite a few times on my morning show. I'll talk a little bit more about it as well. It is a fun, entertaining uh, camp for kids uh, between Wednesday and Friday during their winter break. It's uh, 27th through the 29th. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And it is a good opportunity for kids to learn media, make movies and make shows and just do all sorts of things and and useful things with a computer, essentially. So I'm uh, OK. That's enough selling. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for a pre critic where I prejudge movies based on absolutely nothing but my pre biases. And, you know, my <coughs> hey, I like movies, but now I'm at the point in my life where I become jaded and like, oh, movies are the same, including this one. It's like. You know, Chuck E. Cheese, but evil. Welcome to the world of cheap internet gaming, taking off and creating awareness by following a toxic fandom that, that hates anything related to a property meant for adults, but is directed and targeted at children in this jump scare in Jump Scares, the movie. Join a colorful cast of Chuck E. Cheese wannabes as they try to kill the security guard whose doors need energy to keep them closing for some reason, along with cameras and not blinking. Uh, this one is for the YouTubers, and we all know how YouTubers translate to film. All right, freelance. We have a girl in way over her head get rescued by a mercenary super spy only to get an adventure to stop the thing from getting to the thing before the bad guy steals Curly's lost gold. Uh, tropes include heavy breathing, uh, invading the enemy's base, regular rescues, and then the gal getting her chance to beat the bad guys much to the trained assassin type character. I'm assumed that they'll share a kiss in the end. Uh, then we have Inspector Sun. <coughs> Remember, um, um, 
Murder on the Orient Express or Death on the Nile, which is pretty much more about this. It's basically an animated kid version of this where uh, when a kid's anime movie decides to take on adult contact like Death on the Orient Express or more like Death on the Nile, this murder mystery has an anamorphic animal-human hybrid trying to solve the murder of some guy who is married to a black widow type femme fatale creature. Our protagonist is a male black widow who has to deal with the trust issues when it comes to the femme fatale. Uh, only the femme fatale is a black widow anamorphic animated character so pretty sure it's probably not her even though she is kind of shady the whole movie so that's kind of how it is misdirection enjoy a series of adult jokes placed in a kids movie for parents who will be too busy watching their phones than this movie then we got uh, suitable flesh welcome to the uh, world of horror when somebody with spit personality splits into a slasher killer all the uh, while people will be trying to figure out how to stop someone who is both the victim and the killer at the same time. Uh, it looks like some kind of a cult ritual, so they, there might be demons and such involved. Maybe the demon is the possessed thing and they think it's a split personality, but if you like the movie Reanimator, you might like something that, something that somebody who worked on Reanimator once worked on that cult classic working on this movie. So, yep, it'd probably be for people who are just like, hey, horror movies. I'm a, uh, you know, there's a, always a bunch of horror movie stands out there. I, 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 I honestly don't understand um, a lot of the horror movie uh, obsession with, but I, I, you know, it's a lot more fun to make a horror movie than it is to uh, watch them, to be perfectly honest. All right, up next, uh, we have a brand new dub and stuff from the 1948 Kirk Douglas film, My Dear Secretary. All right, don't laugh at me, boys, but roll! Uh, is that uh, good? Well... How come everyone looks Ugh. mad? Is everyone okay? Hey, listen here. Funny. You're gonna get this seven, I swear. And you know I'm gonna get it because I'm going all in. Nothing can go wrong with oh, going wow. all in. Oh wow, you must really love me to do all your life savings and stuff. So let's give this a roll. Yay! I, uh, Another oons and a doons. Thanks for playing. So not good. Yeah, not good. Let's get out of here. What's wrong with you? You don't get to hand dice at me and yell at me for throwing that dice that you asked me to throw the dice for? Oh, you see? Now she rolls like the way I want her to roll. Oh, yes. Yes, the table's getting hot, boys. Let's all go all in. Come on, everyone. No, you don't. You don't get away from me that easily. You embarrass me in front of all your gambling friends, and they're not even really your real friends. They don't friendship, friendship, all that kind of stuff with you. You understand me? I don't know gambling. I don't know a lot of other things, but I know this thing. I know when I'm being disrespected, and you're being disrespectful to me when you tell me that I'm not doing what I'm I supposed to do. Don't walk away from me. Listen, I'm. Hey, can we sit down for a second? I gotta talk to you, and I don't want to, you know, make. I just let's just have a real heart to heart, just on this little outside bench in the tropical island of whateverville. Well, perhaps we can have a heart to heart, but I'm gonna need a lot of convincing to forgive you. Uh, well, um, I'm really, really, really sorry. Oh, well, that was okay, I guess. Uh, you're the moon, the sun, the earth. You're the reason that I wake up in the morning and all that r romantic stuff and... Well, I'm not looking for a compliment. I'm just looking for a simple apology and explanation of why you're behaving this way. You know, like adults do, if, if that's possible. What I would say is, like, I'm sorry oh, I made... Oh, since you put it that way... You know how you can tell how angry I am? My eyes are moving back and forth like crazy. And that's not cool. I want to be able to not move my eyes so often by studying you. You don't understand that? Listen, you can roll for me. I have this loan shark that can give me all sorts of money. Are, are you really putting your kneecaps on the line for someone like me? Well, I wouldn't put it quite like that, but still. Hello. Mm, sorry to interrupt your fighting or whatever, but you're out of money. Please leave our casino. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some city council stuff. We're kicking things off with uh, John Wilkins, former city council member, talks about the homeless camp uh, camping overnight in a Bancroft Park. And this is what he had to say. And we, we can't use it the way the campers are sitting there. And I uh, have a heart for people that are uh, homeless, you know, and I know we have this ordinance, but there's other places better than this for people to camp out. 
and the way I find it, uh, I've talked to a lot of these people, and they, they're not interested in shelters. They're not interested in anything except living in their camper or by that park, and uh, we need to do something about it. So please, pass an ordinance or something so we can put a sign up saying no camping at the Duck Pond, Bancroft Pond, and I thank you very much. Okay, so that was John Wilkins talking about his frustration of the city. Uh, this is actually kind of like in reaction to how the city is uh, consistently pushing back on this emergency ordinance that they did over the summer to help mitigate how they're going to deal with the uh, um, Idaho's Ninth Circuit of, um, sorry, I'm getting some a lot of some feedback and it's really distracting. And so part of this um, you know, John Wilkins spent 12 years on council before retiring and has been uh, the, more of the conservative voice of council, uh, uh, but as uh, he voted with the city initiatives towards the end of his tenure, and so far the city pushed the emergency housing ordinance for overnight camping back to December to address it further, which would make uh, it the second time the city has pushed this back further to talk about this as well. And one of the homeless people, uh, Killing uh, Shea, uh, talks about the process in terms of overnight camping ordinance, uh, saying that parks and staying a thousand feet from rivers is not feasible uh, um, in how the city is um, basically dealing with uh, encampments. I've had some pretty good interpretations and looks at the maps of the city that will basically be empowered once the camping ordinance that is being hammered out right now is is put into place and it's gross it's like leaving a dog house and that's about all has anybody looked at it what it looks like when this city isn't campable within a thousand feet of a river or a park or a business or a school or anything there's nowhere The only thing you're coming into compliance with is this fourth amendment to your meetings where you might finally actually start listening to what people have to say. Okay. And so Clayton has been talking uh, a lot at the city meetings to kind of remind peop people, especially within the city, that a lot of what they're doing and not doing is... Um, as the result of inaction. And Clayton even called the uh, mayor, Jordan Hess, a lame duck and said that the courthouse lawn would be the only place people like him would be able to go. And it doesn't seem like the city may wait until next year to tackle this overnight camping, especially if the December 10th date comes and they don't address the ordinance on overnight camping. Public hearing for pathways to remove obstacles to housing. So this is one of the many initiatives, you know, uh, building up housing stock, building up opportunities to get more people into housing. This is called Pro Housing. Uh, it's the part of the acronym that goes into pathways to removing obstacles. And this is part of a, a grants application. And Emily Harris-Shears, Housing Community Planning, talks about Pro. So the city's uh, application is focusing on preventing displacement. And we're planning to do that through two main strategies, which is addressing supply and addressing policy and programming. Under supply, we intend to uh, create incentives for new development, um, strengthen our acquisition and disposition of land pra practices and processes to do limited equity um, co-op conversions, and then to also strengthen resident-owned community conversions. They're already an operating model that works really well, uh, but they often limit are limited because of funding. Yep, that's the uh, age-old question is just the idea of funding and being able to do things, heck, doing anything, even the presenter, you know, being paid to present, it costs money. Getting to housing, let alone rental, requires a long process these days. Part of their plan is to help people displaced, and if you are month to month, it becomes too easy to lose your rental. And I've seen it take uh, many friends to uh, many of my friends uh, months to get any kind of approval. So the grace period is so much shorter, which makes displacement so much higher as a result. Another big move is that the landlord tenant program that would put five million dollars of money coming from MRA land sold trust fund additional matching grants to leverage options for su uh, su for supplying more housing emily harris shears talks about uh going 
into a 10% deficit when applying this fund and uh, talked about some of the risk, but the reward is just too uh, good to uh, uh, avoid this. Because we, our policy in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is to serve uh, the city of Missoula plus the five mile radius um, that the health department covers, we actually will serve a few of the communities that are priority communities. And the way the NOFO reads is if you serve any of those, you get the points. So because we serve East Missoula, because we serve um, West Bonner Riverside, um, we are eligible for those points because we're serving into the county, which is a priority area. Okay. And so, f like, when you actually really think about, like, how a lot of these kind of uh, systems are in place, um, especially when it comes to, like, grants and funding and all that kind of stuff, um, a lot of this has to do with, like, organizations and grassroots organizations and nonprofits and groups coming together. And, like, last week I had a presentation from uh, somebody from the... Uh, um, Missoula Housing Authority, and he basically said that there's there has to be a lot more good before the money can actually start flowing in for a lot of these kind of grassroots organizations. So, um, if a lot of things are reactionary, the city a lot of times just don't have the funding to be able to do that. A lot of times, city infrastructures and stuff like that are for the streets, roads, clearing, just the basic infrastructure that the community has uh, built up over a long period of time. But when it comes to like these kind of issues like we were dependent on federal aid during the Obama administration to their 10-year plan to end homelessness which didn't really work and then a lot of those things were cut during the after Trump was elected and then just the pandemic uh, not to mention with everything that's going on and then you know here's uh, uh, Todd uh, Franzebeck um, Habitat for Humanity uh, gave public comment in support of this particular process um, for the Pro Housing Act. We talk about families below 100% of AMI. The reality in this community over the past few years is for a family to afford a conventional home, they have to be well above 250% of AMI. So the families that we are taking care of and the families that this is designed to aid have no other options. We are, we are all trying very hard and there are a lot of groups that are approaching this. But the partnerships that we have with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the land trusts in the area, um, they have already produced results for us. And we are trying to redouble our efforts in production to hope to make a dent in the problem. Yep, and even with last week when they were talking about uh, vouchers and uh, you know HUD, Missoula Housing Authority, um, like they said they have 100 vouchers, but they only have $100,000 for those 100 vouchers, which in a long-term effect would only maybe help uh, for a short amount, short amount of people. So the money would have run out before the vouchers run out, essentially, is how the funding mechanism for a lot of those vouchers are. Andrea Davis from Homeward talks about uh, more about this process and how Homeward has done with the uh, landlord program. Um, the amount of planning and efforts that we have done to date in order to be eligible for a grant of this size and scale um, is really a no-brainer. And it has the opportunity to reach such a vast, um, not only different uh, uh, income targets, but also home types, right? So folks that are earning 0% and living houseless, and folks that have the potential to be homeowners. Um, we are one of the nonprofits that um, Emily reached out to. Um, so at Homeward, we uh, no doubt provided some input. Be happy to continue to private, provide input on the Landlord Liaison Pilot Program that we had done for a while, if, if you find that helpful. Um, and I, I just wanted to um, speak in favor of this opportunity and the vast amount of flexibility it feels it gives us as a community is, is very important. Yep, and this is just one of the many tools that the city is looking into to get grants, workforce housing. For, for the most part, the main goal is to create a 
a giant amount of uh, housing opportunities, dwelling units, and all that kind of stuff. A lot of people um, last week, like I, I always refer to last week because I talked a lot about uh, the um, <coughs> Missoula Housing Authority, which they are the ones that are charged with uh, HUD, many different money revenue streams coming in here as well, and talking about how a lot of uh, grants and opportunities are coming down the pipeline for a lot of different groups as well. And if you're a veteran too, they have another uh, opportunity for people called Valor House. Uh, and Valor helps, it really helps people get back on their feet, not to mention help build a nest egg for people to kind of be able to uh, get out of the Valor House in the first place. So there's a lot of opportunities out there and this is just one of many opportunities that the city is looking forward into to uh, basically uh, hit while the, what is that called, uh, strike while the uh, thing is hot or something? I don't know. Anyways, landlord programs utilizing some of the cities and nonprofit resources to work with landlords and property management to help pay rent from renters who don't make enough. And this program was moved to final consideration by the city to help combat the housing supply issues. The vote on this next uh, meeting, which is November 6th, because next week is the fifth Monday of the month and they usually take that off. Um, another big thing that's happening as well is the rule four in terms of public forms and speech in regards to the Ninth Circuit ruling from the Costa versus City of uh, Costa Mesa, which protected speech w that went profane and use of bad language in public forums. So Gwen Jones, uh, Council President, talks about the point of order and how she can express uh, 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 the point of order in terms of uh, disruptive behavior. So Gwen Jones talks a little bit about that. We don't want meetings to be disrupted. When free speech goes so far to as to disrupt the meeting then it's then it's stepped over lines um, and so we want people to absolutely be able to say their say their thoughts in front of us but in such a way that there are reasonable sideboards so that everyone feels comfortable in this chambers and feels comfortable to continue to come down and provide comment um, and I feel like this rule emphasizes that disrupting the meeting is the line we don't want people to cross and it also clearly signals potential ways in which it, they could disrupt the meeting so it helps to communicate what does and doesn't work and gives us better tools to try and um, how should I say steer the comment to keep it um, keep it in an area where uh, it's not disrupting the meeting. Okay, uh, so uh, last week's committee meeting uh, had the city uh, city lawyer Ryan Sidsbury uh, said that the city would have to take this by a case by case scenario, and there'll be people who feel like their age is not being uh, taken seriously. But from my perspective, if you lose your cool, then anything you say tends to be ignored anyways. Uh, not much slated for uh, committee reports, but uh, as we check below, the Committee of the Whole actually dived into a little bit more of the Food Policy Board. And part of the idea of Food Policy Board is as a grassroots operation sponsored by the city to basically make sure that the concept of like a farm-to-table healthy uh, source is uh, created for people to have that kind of option for that um, wayfinding when it comes to where you eat your food from. So Erica Berglund, board member or uh, vice chair uh, of the Food Policy Board talks about the group's efforts to provide healthy, cheap food for Missoulians on a local level. And this is what she had to say. So we've been talking a lot about school meals um, and how we might get involved. Um, it turns out to be a very complicated topic. Um, because of federal um, policy and, and how that is implemented at the local level. Um, and there's obvious um, financial component to it as well. And the fact that school districts are kind of outside of uh, city county jurisdiction, as you all are well aware. Um, so trying to find out um, ways that our board might be able to um, influence or um, get involved on particularly the nutrition and quality of school meals locally. Um, you may remember our board has, for <laughs> since we've been around, um, talking a lot about local meat processing capacity um, and finding ways that we might, um, as a board, um, kind of leverage our position to continue um, looking into that topic. And uh, so we continue <laughs> to um, focus on that. We're also very interested in food waste reduction and composting and local. All right, so that. 
Uh, I'm going back to my notes. Erica spoke in, you know, a little about this. Uh, the past few years, uh, <coughs> they uh, basically formed this board just before the pandemic, made this board kind of disappear from the public eye. And, you know, it's not necessarily, dis it didn't necessarily disappear. It just like the focus of the city basically became all about the you know, COVID pandemic and everything. And so the point of this was to create a partnerships through Missoula to create food sourcing, a normal thing. Meat was also one of those topics in terms of sourcing our meats in stores since Missoula is nearly autonomous with meat processing. But in terms of that, you know, uh, as f you'd have to go as far as Kalispell from what I can remember from past meetings. So a lot of the meat that is butchered and slaughtered and, <coughs> and then processed here in Missoula are essentially in Montana, so that's still some good news for people who are buying some locally sourced meat by default, even if it is a, a, a national chain of grocery store. So Erica talks about locals looking to sell their meats to the right uh, processors. So this is a little bit more information about the meat processing uh, process because that seems to be one of the big things uh, for this food board right now. Um, focusing on that local meat processing piece, um, we continue to hear from local producers who are um, seeking to sell their products locally um, about the challenges of, of being able to pr process that meat um, locally and in, in an economical way. Um, so we partnered with another UM student to basically host this roundtable discussion um, through the Natural Resource and Conflict Resolution Program. Um, and again, we invited a whole bunch of stakeholders to join us in this conversation. Um, and, and I mentioned some of this, but some of the topics for future focus um, that came out of this conversation are that education and marketing piece, um, basically understanding what it would take for a facility um, to be economically viable in, in Missoula County. All right, so that was just one of the many things because when it comes to like wholesale or any kind of thing like that, a lot of times it's easier to relegate towards uh, like a chain kind of group where they can lean on each other. Um, in many ways, you know, locally, local only, uh, tends to be based on whatever the local economy produces. And a lot of times, it's hardly feasible to do it if you're just local only because yeah i mean as many of the times have shown is like you know it's like the idea is like you want to <coughs> buy locally but then sell out globally if, you, if that really makes sense for from a business perspective but this presentation was about their survey and roundtable discussions about the future what creating better partnerships and fresh ideas from university students in missoula which is the future focused on meat processing and decreasing food waste the main goal of this board is to try to bring in terms it bring in interns and people who have a stake in the future of urban food trees as one of those uh, key terms used in this presentation, Local Food Choice Act, which helps foster successful and resilient local food economies and systems, help increase awareness of local food and diversity of it. Uh, of course, the last bit at the end was volunteering to harvest fruit trees for mi bear mitigation in the Missoula area. So that's one of the many things that they want to try to do. Other community meetings were pretty basic uh, uh, around uh, rezoning and permitting for a music festival at Play Bear Park. This is basically for contracting for the next eight years to have a music festival at Pay Play Fair Park. And this would cost uh, essentially $120,000 each year for eight years and would cost ten dollars per tickets or at the discretion of the group always on which is the group that will be hosting these uh, music festivals at the playfair park and <clears throat> of course there's a lot of back and forth exactly like oh is this going to affect this and that or the turf or anything like that and so the money put into place to make sure that uh, everything is up to code everything that is going to happen will be kind of undone if there's any wear and tear on the grass and most of this will be happening on the soccer fields behind Sentinel High School between Splash Montana and the high school just uh, being able to use a lot of utilize the space and be able to uh, host events there um, if you're interested in that process with the venue and event planning by all means uh, climate conservation and parks is the meeting to go to. Uh, MCAT has also been releasing the Montana Book Festival on our YouTube page this month. And for those of you who couldn't make it and missed out on programs, here are some of them. This one is from one of the uh, presenters, Jennifer uh, Chisek. Uh, I'll take you some of the, through some of the questions in her Q&A formatted book, the, Psil the Psilocybin Handbook for Women which was published this year. And so here so is- So we need her. like a special instrument to be able to look at our traumas or we're gonna get overly triggered about our traumas again. That's an abnormal state of consciousness. When you're in on psilocybin, 
we can look at those traumas almost through this, this helioscope effect where you can look at the traumas without getting burned, right? And it also allows you to reprocess traumas in a new way that can be more beneficial. So that's another example of what is happening in the brain. Um, so when, again, when we're on, when, when that activation of those serotonin receptors happens, uh, it, in, it increases this level of neuroplasticity. So it's a great opportunity to, do, to incorporate behavior change. Um, so the neuroplasticity is really prevalent during the actual journey, but then even after you're no longer on psilocybin, some of those effects remain where you've got this increased level of flexibility in your brain. And so a great, it's a great time after a journey to make behavior changes. So let's say... All right, so there's a little taste of that. And, you know, she does kind of go on, but she, uh, uh, she kind of does a lot of run-on sentences. And so there's not a really good stopping point. So I had to kind of abruptly stop her in the middle of it. But the main point of... These are these are a lot of these uh, public meetings. Uh, these are a lot of these uh, a lot of authors that come to the uh, Montana Book Festival usually in September. And you know these are many of the fruits of the labor and just kind of MCAT Films has been filmed the Montana Book Festival for I gotta say like almost a decade now, if not more. Uh, back when it was its own autonomous, back when it was the part of the Humanities Montana, then it became its own, another organization, kind of hosted it, and then now it became more of its own kind of nonprofit status for the future. Uh, moving forward as well. So um, <clears throat> let's uh, talk about some events that are happening within the city of Missoula. I do have a lot more time than I usually do uh, for the morning show, so I can really deep dive into some of the uh, Missoula events. So if you're interested in finding out what's kind of happening in the city of Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net is the website I usually go to. Um, I'll bring it up right now. So on this website, it is a wonderful source for everything that you want to look at. If you're interested in finding music, you can click on music and it'll show you all the tabs that are related to music. You can go to the arts. It'll show you all the stuff in terms of arts, you know, mostly related to arts and crafts, food beverages, uh, uh, newsletter, education, government. A lot of uh, times the local governments, in accordance to open me uh, meeting laws in the state of Montana, they tend to advertise on MissoulaEvents.net for a lot of the Missoula County events that are happening within the city of Missoula and more. So without further ado, let's kick things off uh, because it is your Halloween weekend uh, and for a lot of the things happening uh, for you guys. And so kicking things off this morning is we got Empower Place at the Missoula Food Bank and Community Center. So this is from Friday, uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. They usually have Tuesday, Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. After school meals are served after 3 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays for kids looking to get some free after school meals. They are hands-on learning center located at the Missoula Food Bank and Community Center dedicated to nourishing the bodies and minds of local children and families. One part community center and one part science museum, one part food hub and one part library. Um, <clears throat> there is a something for everyone in learning at the Empower Place, rich with science exhibits from Spectrum, literacy and STEM programs and books from the Missoula Public Library. Young adults and parents, Empower Place offers enriching experience free of charge for all Missoulians and families. And so that kind of encompasses also the Missoula Food Bank as well. Uh, family Fun Time, Indoor Fun, Mismo Roots, Acro Sports Center, and YMCA of Missoula are the great uh, indoor uh, places. If you want to stay moving, stay active, and you don't want to have the, um, uh, the uh, what's that called? In the intimidation of just a regular gym, these are great indoor activity spaces for a lot of young kids and their families. Uh, Tiny Tales and Storytime, 10.30 a.m. Every, uh, every Friday at the Missoula Public Library, Tiny Tales and Storytime. They do a lot of storytelling, and they also have some uh, crafts, arts and crafts up, up in the art box and also the Imaginarium for people who uh, want to take their kids and have them experience the joys of reading. Library uh, Lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. This is a recurring event every weekday at 11.30 a.m. And it's $5 for people who are 16 and over and $8 for the rest if you just want to go in there and just have a lunch. A lot of the meal prep is done for a lot of the folks there at the Missoula Senior Center. Uh, 40th Public Land Law Conference. The University of Montana is hosting a conference theme is Gathering Wisdom, Building on 40 Years of Public Land Discourse. The lineup of exhibition includes Professor John Leslie, uh, Deputy Director Nada Culver. Uh, John Leslie is a... a um, Professor of Law at the UC Law San Francisco, and this keynote will focus on the history of Americans' public land and our common ground. Uh, Nada Culver is the principal of Deputy Director of Bureau of Land Management, and her keynote will discuss the future of our public lands. Um, that's happening at noon at the University of Montana. I believe it's going to be probably at the law, the uh, Henry Blewett III Law School. Uh, 
I totally butchered that. I'm just going off the top of my head. But yarns and watercolor at 12 noon uh, every single Friday at noon on uh, the fourth floor. They have options between doing a watercolor class or just hanging out doing some watercolor. Yarns for people who like stitch stitching and crocheting. Maybe make that scarf you've been putting off for some time. And, you know, it's winter time pretty early on this year, so you might want to do that. Lego Club at the Missoula Public Library every Friday at 2.30 p.m. at the Imaginarium on the second floor. Um, and then we jump right into some of the uh, late night uh, bands, uh, kicking off with Dan Dubuck uh, at Imagination Brewing Company. I'll never get his name right, no matter how many times I've heard it. I'm sorry, I apologize, but he's going to be playing some folk, acoustic, miscellaneous music at Imagination Brewing Company. He's a great musician. Um, I'm just, I'm just terrible. <laughs> uh, Biomes, Blues, and Brews Free Cycles is hosting UM's Environmental Law Group at the annual uh, benefit starting at 6.30 p.m. supporting the appeal fund for Held versus State. This is the part where the uh, Montana kids sued the state for causing climate change and they won. Uh, the event features live music from Missoula favorites, The Spills. Dinner with Masala will be provided by the purchase of a ticket. Four History Buffs is going to be at 7 p.m. This is part of the, universe, uh, the Missoula Public Library's History Western Montana Restricted uh, oh, actually, Western Montana's restricted districts with Sophia Eatery. Um, it's here, sorry. Um, for History Bus is held every last Friday of each month from 7 to, five, nine, 7 to 9 p.m. Join guest speakers for lively and entertaining presentations. And so the uh, history of restricted red light districts in the cities of Missoula and Hamilton, looking at the influence of these ostracized communities had on the Missoula and Hamilton, looking at uh, the yep, development of the Western Montana region. They also discuss the diversity of demographics of these districts and how these forgotten Montanans paved the way for our society today. Mel Brooks, Young Frankenstein is the last weekend to check out uh, MCT's uh, Center for Performing Arts, their community theater, putting on Young Frankenstein. Um, and it's going to be happening every night at 7.30 p.m. with an earlier evening show on Sunday at 6.30 with uh, matinees on Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. A Little Murder Never Hurt Anyone is a show being presented by Big Sky High School uh, at 7.30 p.m. both tonight and Saturday night at 7.30 p.m. This is uh, written by Ron Burness, a Big Sky High Schoolers fall comedy production. And this is $8 at the door. Uh, the Rocky Horror uh, Show is at 8 p.m. and 11.45 p.m. for the Late Night Owls. It's happening tonight at the Wilma. Um, it's the Rocky Horror Show Picture Show. It's not the Rocky Horror Picture Show movie. It's basically a performance by a bunch of uh, hardcore Rocky Horror stands as they perform live at the theater. Copper Mountain Band is going to be at the Sunrise Saloon. It's also going to be a Halloween costume party to dress up. Gods and Monsters costume party. Uh, it's going to be electronic music at Monks tonight. It's 9 p.m. Uh, Disparate Electronic is going to be at Top Hat Lounge. They're going to have some electronic music. And it is also uh, the last weekend of your farmer's market. So last week for farmer's market, it, so get your produce, goods, uh, vegetables all set. Most people will probably be uh, wrapping up um, this weekend just because of some of the colder weathers, but there's going to be some of the hardcore people uh, left behind to do some stuff. They'll have some food trucks and more, but things will really start winding down after this weekend as we get into the uh, November time and the election season. I'll talk a little bit more about the election after my event. So. <clears throat> Missoula Fall Scholastics Chess Tournament. St. Joseph Elementary and Middle School is hosting a chess tournament at 9 a.m. Um, on Saturday. Missoula Art Museum does tours every Saturday at 11 a.m. every week. Halloween Skate Jam at the uh, Mobosh Skate Park. And this is going to be a Halloween Skate Jam. Dress up as your costume and do some skating. Uh, MCAT Saturday drop-ins. Uh, we're not doing a themed uh, drop-in, so it's any, any kid can come in here if they want to dress up. Sure, why not? Go ahead. They can do whatever they want. Uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., MCAT is hosting a Saturday drop-in for the kids. It is a great opportunity to do some stop animation with Legos and other things that they bring in themselves. Unplug and recycle proper methods for e-waste disposal. Missoula Public Library, do you have an old computer, smartphone, or electronic device? Need of recycling? Bring them to the bring them in and learn what e-waste is, what your local options for disposing of it and other electronic properties with um, Mikkel Funk, owner of Missoula uh, Retech. 
and they will give an overview of e-waste recycling options in Missoula and considerations for proper disposal. You can also, you know, take your old batteries to Batteries Plus if you want to dispose of them properly as well. Saturday Kid Activities, the Natural History Center is doing a spooky season. October can remind us of the spooky creatures, insects, spiders, bats, and more. Join us in this month and explore some of the creatures and discover they may not be as creepy as we think. Matt, not Montana History Center, this is a drop-in from 1 to 3 p.m. They stole our idea here at MCAT. Uh, an evening of ghosts and stories. Um, book reading at the Frame of Mind starting at 5 p.m. John Floridas is going to be at playing some folk music at Imagination Brewing Company starting at 6 p.m. Wolf and the Moons at Draft Works is going to be performing starting at 6 p.m. and going to be some rock music. And then um, Halloween night orienteering. So if you easily get lost and you want to learn how to not get lost in the forest, orienteering is hosted at the University of Montana starting at 7 p.m. It's the sport of navigating a course through a terrain with a map and a compass. It combines the physical aspect of hiking and running, the metal challenge of reading a map, and most of all, the joy of getting out into the woods. They provide beginning instruction and all the orienteering uh, specific equipment. This is $5 for first timers and open to all ages and experience levels. Costumes are encouraged. Rocky Horror Show again on your Saturday night at 8 p.m. and they're probably gonna do another one at 11.40 uh, 11 45 a.m. just before the midnight uh, bell rings. The Gravy Ladies at the Old Post is going to be playing folk music starting at 8 p.m. Karaoke at Westside Lanes at 9 p.m. Tanner Law and his band Halloween Bash at the Sunrise Saloon. Country music at 6, 9 30 p.m. on Saturday. DJ Chris Moon every Saturday at 10 p.m. Kyle Hunter the, and the Mountain Standard is going to be playing some country music at Top Hat starting at 10 15 p.m. And then Sunday, like I said, all under one roof here at the Missoula Public Library starting at 12 noon to about 4 p.m. here at the Missoula Public Library. MCAT and all our partners here at the library are going to be hosting various different uh, areas in which you can have some fun. MCAT will be having a Halloween dance party in the back while we have some stop animation stuff in the front for the, some of the kids. And so a lot of Great opportunities for you guys as well. You can go to MissoulaPublicLibrary.org for more information. Too Spooky, Volume 3 Horror Film with Live Music Score. Suite 2 is doing a screening of John Carpenter's Halloween 3 Season of the Witch with live electronic music. Um, what else? Um, let's jump into some of the Tuesday night because that is the official uh, Halloween night and stuff. They're doing a uh, some of the fun stuff as well is the Witch Brigade uh, bike ride. 5 p.m. Kiwanis Park. Join the magical Witch Brigade as they ride from Kiwanis Park to downtown Higgins Avenue. Come as whatever magical creature you are, all ages, and this is about a two-mile bike ride from Kiwanis Park. Uh, Missoula Fire Department Trick or Treat. Um, this is going to be uh, from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. to trick or treat with your firefighters. The firefighters, I AFF Local 271 will be handing out candy and you can even check out the fire engines starting at 5.30 p.m. Then there's Crappy Halloween Contest uh, at the DraftWorks Brewing Company at 7 p.m. Other than the expected mini Halloween activities to happen the weekend. And remember, dressing up is mostly for children and adults that dress up should aim to have a safe weekend and watch out for the trick-or-treaters as it will be dark around 6.30 p.m. Best to aim for a 4 to 6 p.m. window to take your kids out trick-or-treating. But also a big a warning as we are also dealing with legalization of marijuana in the state of Montana. They also have gummies. The entry system to a lot of uh, drugs with a lot of kids is they're able to hide a lot of their THC input and hide it from their parents so they get the concentrates. And because they're concentrates, they have a lot more THC than a lot of things can ever happen. So when your uh, kids get candy, make sure you double check your candy to make sure that they haven't been laced with anything or having anything that's on them. You never know. So, you know, a lot of times this can happen through negligence. There have been some reports of some kids accidentally eating some uh, THC cannabis candy during these times as well. And that seems to be the modern day uh, concern of, uh, of, the, of moving into more legalization in other states and around the uh, United States as well. So that's something you should also uh, look into as well as you're uh, expecting to have a good Halloween weekend. And so I want to thank you guys for joining me. And uh, also, if you haven't gotten your ballots um, in your mail by now, you're not going to get them. And so you're going to have to wait until November 7th to do the official vote. And the voting polls will be open until 8 p.m. from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Tuesday, November 7th. And you guys can look up your voter information by going to myvoterpagemt.com. Uh, again, that's myvoterpagemt.com. You can find out your voter status. You'd have to put your information in to figure out your own status. I'd show you the page, but then I would have to show you my personal information. But that's, uh, 
that's about it. Yeah, there's not much else going on. I can't think of anything else I can talk about. I can talk some more if you like, but I'm going to wrap up my show here, right here and right now. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph.